Okay, the title of his presentation is Soil Testing for Biological Function and Carbon Dynamics. We are getting into the how right now. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Lance as he walks on the stage. So Lance Gunderson is the president and co-owner of Regen Ag Labs. He is a renowned expert on the Haney Soil Test and the PLFA test, which is a fungal bacteria test. His experience at reviewing over 100,000 soil samples has given him a very unique insight on how soil health results relate to management in regenerative agricultural systems. So Lance is also the founder of the Soil Health Innovations, which is offering SR1 instrumentals for measuring soil respiration and consulting services. Regen Ag Lab offers Haney PFLA tests as well as soil enzymes, water soluble aggregates, water holding capacity, TOC, along with more conventional soil, plant tissue, and water analysis. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Lance Gunderson. Thank you, Jess. Thanks for coming. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Oh, I get to talk before lunch instead of after lunch. Yes. I usually go after lunch. The only problem with today is that I had to follow Russell and uh, Jimmy. And so you'll notice I'm wearing a black hat because if you can't beat them, join them. And if I get excited like Garth Brooks and throw it in the crowd, I will need it back. I do promise you that. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, I can't tell you how good it feels to get out of a laboratory and actually see somebody. Um, other than the same faces I see every day. I spent seven or eight weeks this summer sleeping on a cot in my office because I didn't have air conditioning. I'm not as strong as I used to be. So it feels good to get out, see everybody, and uh, get to hear the story behind Prairie Food, the ribbon cutting yesterday. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about some of the tests that we are running to try to evaluate not only Prairie Food, but also help you with some of the transitions and some of the tracking of soil health on your farm. Um, as we've talked about and you've heard from a lot of the other presenters, soil health is really difficult to define and it's not defined by any single measurement. Uh, unfortunately, they wouldn't let me talk for seven hours, so we're not gonna cover all the measurements, we're just gonna talk about a few of them. I think Trish showed a slide similar to this earlier physical, chemical, biological, and where they overlap, we've got, you know, soil health, right? And I think I stole this from the NRCS, and, and we see things like this. This is what it looks like to me. In the world of testing, this is how we'd look at this. Physical health, chemical health, biological health, and you've got all these different things. So underneath physical, texture, soil structure, porosity, bulk density, aeration, right? On the chemical side of things, how many of you have heard of CEC or base saturation? These are the things that we typically measure in a soils lab. This is what most conventional tests focus on, right? And then down here we've got biological, biodiversity, organic carbon, microbial biomass, all of those things. So I'm going to focus mostly on the biological test and talk about how those relate to the chemical and physical aspects, okay? So before I start talking about testing, if you look at this slide, I get this question a lot. Here's a bag of soil. I want you to run a test on it. What test? Trust me, you don't want me to run all of these tests because I will be forced to send you a bill for $800 for a soil temple. And then people get really mad at me because they said, what happened to my $8 grid sample? Well, this is not an $8 grid sample. So before you can do that, you really have to establish your purpose. We talk a lot about establishing your purpose when it comes to management, right? What is it you are trying to accomplish? But that same purpose has to be tied in with your testing program. So if you're going to measure something, why are you wanting to measure what you want to measure? So is your goal to reduce input costs? Is it to increase water infiltration and retention? 
Do you want to monitor your microbial community? What, what are your goals? But it's important to establish those and then build a testing program around those goals. Once you build that program, you want to try to be as consistent as possible. Now, when I say that, obviously you need to be adaptable, right? As your, as your farm develops, as your operation develops down this journey, you will have to make changes to your program. Hopefully your goals change, right? So you might tweak some of the ways you're gonna measure things and how you're gonna do it. But this is really important because when we talk about these different tools that I'm gonna introduce here in a minute, how many of you know what a compound miter saw is? Anybody tried to cut bathroom tile with a compound miter saw? I wouldn't try it. You ever used a hammer to change a light bulb? You have to apply the right tool to the right situation. It sounds really silly, but these are tools, right? And so we don't want to be applying the wrong tool to the wrong goal, the wrong situation. Let's dive right into science stuff. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I like it. And I apologize, I am fighting a cold, so my voice is not too good today. You get to hear, uh, you get to hear sexy cold voice. Try to contain yourself. But this here is a cross section of a bacterial cell, a bacterial membrane. Look at all the complex stuff we got going on in here. We got protein used probably 18 times in here. Peripheral protein, integral protein, surface protein, glycoprotein, a fancy word for sugar tied to protein. We got all of these things going on in this bacterial membrane, but there's some really useful things in here for us that we can measure. So if we strip away all of that other stuff, we're left with what's called a phospholipid bilayer. A phospholipid bilayer simply is this. It keeps things that should stay outside of the cell, outside of the cell, and it keeps things that should be inside of the cell, inside the cell. It's made up of phospholipids, so phosphate are these round pieces out here. Everything in between, these are called hydrophobic or water-hating or water-disliking fatty acids. So this is what separates the environment from the inside of the cell. Every organism that is made up of cells, which means every organism, has this. And we're able to use this and measure this in a laboratory. We call this PLFA, or the phospholipid fatty acid test. Now this test has been around for a really long time. They use it to identify fatty acid profiles in manure or in meat. Uh, they do it for lake sediment. They do all kinds of things with this. But more recently, stepping outside of the research world, they've started using it to identify and track microbial communities. So, Jimmy showed pictures of earthworms. We saw earthworm castings. You can see mice. You can see different things in the field. Unfortunately, we see grasshoppers. It's really difficult to see bacteria and fungi, right? You can't drive by the field and count them. You can't just look at them. So we're going to use this to try to get an idea of what they are and who they are. And we're able to do this by, or sorry, we're able to look at this cell membrane and we can quantify the amount of fat in your soil. You ever thought about that? Measure fat in your soil. Fat is biologically derived. Your soils are not fat. And I would argue that most of your soils are probably pretty skinny. And this is actually one of those times when we talk about feeding the soil you are feeding the soil to literally build fat in the soil. So we are measuring the fat. Now, when a microorganism dies, and that happens a lot, what happens to that fat? It breaks down. You think other organisms probably want to eat that, right? So it doesn't last very long. 
When an organism dies, now we can use that to our advantage because what this represents is living organisms. This is not an artifact from 30 years ago or five years ago. This is actually more real time. So we can actually measure these, quantify them, and track this. And it's influenced by not only your environment, yes, rainfall, temperature, those things do have an, an impact, but it also represents, or it's also uh, influenced by your management. So tillage practices, fallow practices, cropping practices, diversity, et cetera, that can all be reflected on this test. So this is just an example of what the PLFA analysis report looks like from Region Ag Lab. Um, you'll see up here we have a total biomass number. We have a functional group diversity index. These are your two most important numbers. Um, I'm going to go through just a few of these on the next slides just to kind of show you what kind of information you can get from this and how you can use it, what you can learn from it. Uh, but just wanted to give you a brief overview of this is what that, that type of report looks like. So when you try to interpret PLFA, this is always one of the biggest challenges with this, is that a lot of these tests are new, relatively new. They're things we've never seen before. I spend 80% of my day trying to help people understand what these results mean and what it not only means in context, but what it means directly on your farm and how you'd use this. So this is a big table that was put together looking at several thousands of these to establish kind of a ranking. The idea here is that we can have a balance going on. Yes, we want more microbes, higher biomass, right? Higher total biomass, very important. A soil that can support a lot of microorganisms is generally considered a healthier soil system. Just like if you look at a forest that has a lot of deer in it, you might say that's a healthy system. The other side of that same coin, though, is diversity. If we looked at that forest and the only thing we saw were deer, we could argue that that's not a very healthy system, right? There's a lot of deer, but there's nothing else. And so we also look at this diversity. And overall, we want to see something that has, you know, relatively high biomass, but the diversity is the key. So I've looked at samples from 13 or 14 different countries, um, almost every state in the US. I'll pick on people from Iowa today. I love, oh yes, you bet. I love picking on people from Iowa, they're resilient. So a lot of times we see soils that have really high biomass, 3,500, 4,000, but the diversity score, the functional group diversity on this is usually very poor. So we have soils that have the resources to support a large microbial community, but not all. Some of those situations, we have very narrow or complete lack of crop rotation. So some of these fields have been 30 year continuous corn. They produce a lot of corn so you can support a lot of microbes, but you are selecting for a community that is shifted towards corn production. So the diversity, the lack of diversity in that system above ground is creating a lack of diversity below ground. And then we have problems with, uh, anybody have uh, trouble with corn stalks from 2018 still? And we see that a lot. And we get comments about that a lot. And especially, and I'll expand but beyond Iowa, I'll just pick on all the I states. How about that? I hear that a lot from the I states. It's not because they're dry. It's because they've just got a microbial community that struggles to utilize those things. So diversity is key. There's one important thing I want to point out. There is no standard ranking established. So when somebody sends a sample and they say, what should this number be? That's very difficult to answer. We use this test to track change over time. We want to see, are you moving in a positive direction or in a negative direction based on your management? But it's very difficult to say, well, this is what your number is, and relative to everybody else in the country, that's good or bad. Now, that's very hard. 
There is no standard ranking established for that. Uh, I'm just going to talk about these, these top three report ratios. How many of you have heard about the fungi to bacteria ratio? Heard about the importance of fungi in the system? So whenever we talk about fungi and bacteria and we talk about the ratio, you'll hear things, you'll read things, somebody will say this, somebody like me standing up here will say, you want a ratio of one to one. Okay. Now, while that's true in a lot of cases, I will say that the PLFA test will not yield you a ratio that is one to one, ever. Okay, I'm going to say ever. I've yet to see it. I've looked at 40,000 or more of these. The reason has to do with the way the test works. Bacteria have more phospholipids in their cell membranes than fungi do. So what that means is, is that if you're trying to count the organisms based on PLFA, you're automatically giving more weight to bacteria. So you'll notice here on this report, we have this type of table. 0.25 is basically a one-to-one. -one. So if you're using PLFA and you see this 0.25 ratio and you kind of get discouraged because somebody else told you it should be one-to-one, -one, you are sitting at one-to-one. -one. That's a very important distinction. Now, we talk about different management practices that lead to different microbial communities, right? Fungi are filamentous. Do you think they enjoy tillage? No, they don't. Bacteria love it. They think it's a roller coaster ride. They like it. Doesn't bother them really a bit. Fungi don't like it. Uh, it was brought up earlier about how tillage speeds up soil uh, structure destruction, right? And it collapses the soil pores and the aggregates fall apart. Protozoans are subaquatic organisms, meaning that they actually live and move through the pore spaces in the soil. If somebody took a bunch of bulldozers and decided to plow up our entire railroad system in this country and all of our highways, do you think we'd be able to transport things very well? Okay, I understand that we can't transport anything now, but I mean, let's pretend it was kind of normal, okay, and then how does that infrastructure work? Well, the soil aggregates and the pore spaces are the infrastructure of the soil. That is how organisms and nutrients and water move throughout that system. When you collapse that system, you shut down the transport system. And so protozoans, so these types of management effects is what you can see reflected on this type of test. Mycorrhizal fungi are another one we measure on this test. Mycorrhizal fungi are symbionts, obligate symbionts, meaning without a plant, they do not survive. Do you think mycorrhizal fungi enjoy fallow? Mm -mm. They do not. And we can see that with this test. When we see summer fallow wheat, um, and yes, I'm sorry, I'm picking on Kansas a little bit because I've had real world examples of this over and over again. Why are my mycorrhizal numbers so terrible? Why do I see a response by putting on this mycorrhizal product or why do, inoculant or why do I see it? It has to do with management practice. You're seeing that response directly because of the fallow. If you remove the fallow, you'll stop seeing the response. And we see that over and over again. So these types of tools are kind of there to help you understand that. I mentioned protozoa to bacteria. So this is another ratio. Why do we care about protozoans and bacteria? Does anybody know what the carbon to nitrogen ratio of mature wheat is? Like wheat stubble. Around 80 to 1. Corn stalks are around the same. Does anyone know what the seed in ratio of a bacteria cell is on average? Eight to one. Yeah, eight to one, that's pretty close. I've even heard down to four to one. So we think that crops like wheat and corn, milo, they require all this nitrogen, right? But in reality, that soil microbiome 
those bacteria, they have a much larger need and much higher demand for nitrogen than your crop does. They are little bags of fertilizer. Now, when a bacteria cell takes nitrogen in and holds on to it, does your crop get to use it? No. Not until that cell dies and it decomposes or it releases that. Protozoans graze on bacteria. How many of you raise livestock? A few of you? So what happens when you feed cattle corn stalks and then you turn around and feed them alfalfa hay? Composition of that manure changes, right? One of them's a little higher nitrogen tie-up. You got to supplement with mineral, protein, etc. The other one, you're releasing it. Protozoans consume bacteria, they have a different carbon to nitrogen ratio, about 15 to 1. So when they consume five bacteria cells, they end up with five times the amount of nitrogen they need. Where does the rest of it go? Back out into the soil system, right? And if that's waste product like nitrate and ammonium, who uses nitrate and ammonium in your cropping system? Keyword cropping system. Your crop, that's what we fertilize with, right? So this is a really integral part of the nitrogen cycle. This is what drives a lot of that process. So it's important you don't get it without soil structure, you don't get it without water infiltration, you don't get it without a bacterial community, but that's why building up this biomass and holding on to that and diversifying is really important. Gram positive and gram negative bacteria. This is, I always point this out, it's one of my favorite ones. Because a lot of people, and this is not a joke, and I'm not poking fun at anybody. Positive, good, negative, bad. I get that question all the time, right? Gram positive, good, gram negative, bad. Has nothing to do with that. It literally has to do with what color they turn when you put a stain on them. And that stain was developed by a man named Graham. So when you put this purple stain on them, if they turn purple, that's a gram positive. If they turn pink, that's a gram negative. I only tell you that because it doesn't matter, and I find it funny. <laughs> it means nothing as far as we're concerned. But in the soil, I want to show you the structure of gram positive and gram negative cells. On the left, we have a gram negative cell. We have two membranes. An outer membrane, a really thin cell wall made of peptidoglycan, and a really, or then the, the inside uh, membrane. Gram positive, we have a cell membrane and a really thick outer cell wall. Now, why does that cell wall matter? Anybody watch, uh, I don't know, what's a popular stuff, like Game of Thrones or any of that stuff? Like, that? you ever see people like sitting, I think of Braveheart. You get a castle with a moat and a great big wall. Why do we have that? Protection. Protection. Gram-positive bacteria are better adapted to harsh environments. Drought, extreme hot, extreme cold. When the conditions aren't right, they literally hide behind those cell walls. They go dormant. They sit there. Right? It's like a siege. So in Jimmy's example earlier, it was so dry, they were all sitting out by the pickup truck, and it was so dry and couldn't do anything. Took, what, six hours to dig a hole. You had to get dynamite out the whole nine yards, right? The next day, it rained five inches. These organisms are sitting there waiting for that. And then when that happens, they take advantage. Gram-negative bacteria don't do near as, nearly as well. They can't survive those types of conditions for long. So how do we use this to our advantage? Well, you talk about management again and the how. When you start covering the soil, does your temperature swings happen? No. Do you get incredible evaporation or you get raindrop splash and sealing of soil? In other words, you're adding a buffer. A healthier soil has a larger buffer against environmental impact. 
So what we typically see early on in the season, I think uh, soils get cold here too, right? Okay. Early on in the season when soils are frozen and they're cold, we see gram-positive dominated communities because they can survive that type of condition. Hopefully, throughout the growing season, we start to see a more balanced community, and then as we go into fall, we start to see more of a gram-positive community. Now, that's going to happen no matter what, but based on management, you can actually prolong the time that you have this balanced community, and that's really important. So again, you can see this through management. And it's not about that one's good or one's bad. We're using this to tell us something about your soil environment. Are you mitigating the effects of climate and environment through management? There is a whole lot more we could talk about on PLFA, but that has got to be the most boring subject matter I've ever talked about. And trust me, I did a master's degree on it. it worst two years of my life. Then I started doing PhD work and I worked on the Haney test. This one's actually a lot more exciting to me um, because I think this one has a lot more impact. Uh, but I, do want to I did want to talk about PLFA because it, it is important, especially it's one of the few ways you can really kind of evaluate a microbial community. So I've shown some of these slides before. I apologize. This is our traditional approach to soil testing. We're going to measure plant available nutrients. I put plant available in quotation marks. I think Trish uh, kind of alluded to this earlier. You send a soil sample to a lab. How many of you have heard of uh, Malik 3? Bray 1, Bray 2, Olson, ammonium acetate. The list goes on and on and on, right? When's the last time you had a pivot turned on and you started pumping Malik 3 solution through your pivot? Hopefully never. When's the last time it rained Malik 3? Never. Or ammonium acetate. Right, so I put available in quotation marks because we use these chemistries in the industry to try to tell you what nutrients are available. And the analogy I always show people, I said, have you ever taken a penny? I think back in uh, elementary school, they tell you, take a penny, drop it in a cup of water. You can take a penny and drop it in Coca-Cola, and what happens? Well, over time, that penny will dissolve in Coca-Cola, right? So if I asked you how much of that zinc was available in that penny, what do you think happens when I drop it into concentrated sulfuric acid? It dissolves in a few minutes. So the idea of what is available, what is extractable, is dependent on the strength of the extracts you're using in the laboratory. The other thing we look at is soil pH. Soil pH is very important. We're not going to ignore pH moving forward. We're not going to ignore any of this. We're just going to look at it a little differently. And organic matter. We'll talk a lot more about organic matter. Ultimately, we take this information and you tell us what you're trying to do and the lab says, okay, based on what you're trying to do and based on this, here's what your fertility recommendations are, right? Pretty straightforward. Problem is, is that it's basically focused all on fertility, soil fertility, and, and plant nutrient. It has nothing to do with biology. So if you're farming a dead system this tends to work okay. Again, matching the right tools to the right situation. But when you start farming in a system where you are diversifying and integrating covers and integrating products, biological products, and integrating all these things and stimulating microbes through prairie food and driving the system, you just opened a box to a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and you're probably not going to know what that's supposed to look like if you're only holding 10 pieces, right? So these simple measurements, we got to move beyond that if you're trying to farm in that direction. Why? Well, because we need a test that is designed to look at nature's way of doing things. Rob said it yesterday during the rib ribbon cutting. Prairie food is going back to the way Mother Nature did it, or does it, right? 
Well, it does not rain Malik 3. So we cannot use Malik 3. Nature grows a skin for living systems. We call those weeds in agriculture, don't we? But why are they there? Why are they growing? Yeah, they're opportunist species. Mother Nature doesn't like fallow. She doesn't like bare soil. Cycles nutrients. Who fertilized the prairie before we came along? Buffalo, God, all of those are right. Microbes, right? It's diverse. There are no monocultures in nature. We spend billions and billions of dollars every year trying to fit a monoculture into a system that does not accept monocultures. Because our combines like to harvest a monoculture, we like to sell a monoculture, we like to plant a monoculture. So Mother Nature doesn't do this. It seeks balance. There's always a balance. So you hear a lot about ratio balancing on nutrients, or you hear a lot about you know, the balance between carbon and nitrogen, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Did you know that the carbon to nitrogen ratio of soil organic matter right here in Pratt, Kansas is exactly the same as it is in Brazil? It's also exactly the same as it is in Alberta and outside of Sydney, Australia. Mother Nature does that. It's highly integrated, and Mother Nature has years and years and years of R&D experience. I've been doing this for 20 years. I know nothing. I was waiting for everybody to get up and say, okay, I guess we'll just leave then. But when you really think about it, and you think about how long some of these systems have been in place and what's been going on, Mother Nature's got a great advantage over all of us. Builds plant root networks. So how can we take some of those concepts and develop them into a soil test? Dr. Haney, uh, Rick and Liz, and a few others there at the USDA office, they did work on this, and this is what they came up with. So here's a schematic approach. We're still going to talk about nutrients. We're going to talk about a different pool of nutrients, microbes, this water extractable carbon, and a seed in balance. So the first one here, looking at these nutrients. A different extract. How many of you are very aware that roots actually leak things out into the soil, right? That's been a big topic, root exudates. What if I told you that up to 60% of all the carbon captured by Sorghum Sudan was actually leaked out into the soil? That's an overwhelming amount, isn't it? Think about how much tonnage you could produce if they didn't leak any of that out. Why do plants do this? There's a reason. They're feeding the system. Plants have one thing that they can acquire very easily in, a, in their environment. Carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Primary producers, right? All of us are consumers. Microbes, by, by and large, are consumers. If you don't have the ability to photosynthesize, you are a consumer. So, plants use carbon to feed the system. Now, I mentioned before, microbes have a really good affinity for getting nutrients, and they like to hold on to nutrients. Well, if I was standing up here and I had all the water that this whole place had, I'd be willing to trade you a bottle of water and I'd be trading you for dollar bills. Carbon is the dollar bill. The plants are trading that over to the microbes to get nutrients. We want to use an extract that mimics that process. So Rick designed this extract. He calls it H3A because H3A is a whole lot easier to say than Haney, Haney, Harnell, and Arnold. 
it mimics soil solution by using organic acids that plants produce and leak out into the soil system. From that extract, we're going to measure all of these things. So these are things that you have seen if you've done a soil test. Nitrate, phosphate, potassium, calcium, et cetera, et cetera, right? But the approach is different. Instead of using Malik 3 or Brave, we're going to look at this. The second part of this, I'm going to skip over organic N and P real quick. The second part of this is microbial biomass. This is the instrument used to measure microbial biomass. It is just a giant respiration machine. I say giant, it's not really very big. We are measuring carbon dioxide. So what happens when you eat lunch, hopefully if I stop talking, what happens when you eat lunch? You are a consumer, right? What are you taking in? Carbon. Yep, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, hopefully some nutrients, you know, potassium, phosphorus. What are you exhaling? Carbon dioxide. Congratulations, you now understand aerobic metabolism. That's all you need to know. Organisms do the same thing. So uh, I won't pick on Mark, but I'm going to ask Mark, what would happen if I went out and decided to jog around this building? Yeah, I thought you were just going to say I'd die. Yeah, yeah. He's right. My demand for energy would increase. You breathe harder, right? You're burning more fuel and you're releasing more carbon dioxide. We can measure the amount of carbon dioxide your soil gives off. That is an indicator of how hard your soil is working for you. How many microbes are there? The more CO2 it produces, the more work is being done, right? So the way this works is you use a drying and rewetting technique. Does it get dry here? No. Does it get wet here? Okay, that one might be no. Okay, the point is, is that it gets dry and it rains. When this happens, I told you those microbes are sitting there waiting for that opportune time, right? You have a burst, a flush of activity. How high that flush is is relative to the amount of microbes you have. Don't read this. This is just the amount of information you get from that one number. So let's say you're out managing your farm. You run a soil test and you look at soil respiration and unfortunately, it's down here in this low to very low range, okay? That's all right. Got to start somewhere. What are the implications? Well, when it comes to nutrient cycling, if the microbes are doing that work and they're not able to do it, you've got slow nutrient cycling, residue decomposition, um, high carbon residue might last two to three years. These are some of the implications you've got. So then what can you do on a management side to increase that? Well, what you're doing is, yeah, you're building a fire. That's my analogy. You are building a biological fire in that soil. And so to increase this respiration, to get the system going, it's not just about feeding the system carbon. It's about feeding it the right carbon. Planting cereal rye like Russell does, 10 feet tall, when you've got a really small biological fire, you are going to be very, very upset. Because that rye is going to be high carbon and it is going to sit there for years. And then everybody says this, great, now I got a residue problem. No, you don't. You have the same problem you had before, right? <laughs> yeah. You burn it. Yeah, no, you've got the same problem you had before. You have a biological problem. But we fed the biology the wrong stuff. Too much. Too high carbon. So you're going to come in with a little higher brassicas, legumes. Maybe you're going to bring in a compost, manure, uh, prairie food, obviously. Those types of things to jumpstart that system. To get it going. 
And that is the goal. But as that fire builds, what happens to the demand of carbon within the entire system? It increases as well, right? Has anybody burned anything in here? Am I just using the wrong analogy? <laughs> Todd's like, yeah, I'm a pyro over here. I love it. But as you build a larger fire, it demands more fuel. As your microbial biomass increases, you have to shift your management to keep up with that. So many people want to go out and plant a cover or apply a product or do those things, but they're not understanding the context because we haven't run the test. We don't know. And so we'll go out and plant something. And I will say this, and I apologize. This is from six years ago. And if this person's in the room, I mean no harm because I don't even remember who told me this. Western Kansas had a guy call me one time. He says, cover crops are the worst thing ever. I'll never do this again. They're junk. I said, what's the problem? He said, I have no moisture left for my wheat crop. And I said, okay, what'd you plant? Monoculture sun hemp. With all due respect, I said, why? He goes, well, because I got a great deal on it from the seed guy. I said, I'm sure you did. You planted a subtropical water-loving crop as a monoculture and let it grow this tall in an arid environment. Right concept, wrong practice, right? So again, it's understanding these types of things to help you design a program so you don't end up in those situations. That's the goal. Talk about organic NNP and water extractable carbon. I talk about these together. So water extractable total nitrogen. Has anybody talked about nitrogen on a soil test outside of the context of nitrate. When we run soil tests or you send a soil test to a lab, traditionally, if you're talking nitrogen, you're talking nitrate. Nitrogen exists in the soil in hundreds or even thousands of different compounds. Nitrate is one of them. We talk about nitrate because when we buy fertilizer, ultimately we want it to be converted to nitrate or ammonium, and it usually goes to nitrate to be taken up by the crop. But we have nitrogen in all of these parts. This is just one. If you Google nitrogen cycle, you'll get 64,000 photos on Google, and this is one of them. But on this test, we're going to look at water extractable. Now, water, why water? I spent 13 years in college trying to be an analytical chemist and studying biology, and we're using water. I also did this when I was five, apparently, and didn't know it. It rains water. And I actually had to ask Rick Haney that question. I called him up, and I said, Dr. Haney, I'm kind of embarrassed. I didn't really know him well yet, and I said, uh, why are we using water? And he says, well, Lance, last time I checked, it rained water. <laughs> Me being the uh, smart ass that I am, excuse my language, I said to him, I said, well, geez, Rick, I'm really glad you went to school for 12 years to figure that out. And he says, well, you've been going to school for 12 years. You still haven't figured it out. <laughs> and I knew right then, I was like, I like this guy. I, <laughs> he's on to something here. I mean... But that's what happened in the world of academia. It literally took him 12 years of academics to figure out that it rains water. Sorry. We use water as an extract on this part of the test. Now, we're still going to measure ammonium and nitrate because those are plant available. And they, if they're soluble in water, they can get into your crop. But there's a fraction of nitrogen out there that is not nitrate and ammonium, and that is called organic N. That's a fancy term for protein, amino acids. What happens if we drink nitrate? If I put nitrate in here, what happens? What happens if you feed nitrate to your livestock? Kills them, right? I like steak. And if you don't believe that, I got to eat two of them last night, two of them last night. 
I like steak. I like protein. Microbes as consumers want to eat protein. When they do so, they create nitrate and ammonium, the plants like that. Again, see the cycle happening here? Why do we grow plants? To, to store carbohydrates, to store protein, to store, because we want to eat them, right? We eat them and it goes back. It's, it's, it's just cycle. But we have circumvented that cycle in a lot of ways by we'll export it, we'll add fertilizer. That's how we complete the cycle. Carbon itself is a cycle. And this is the one I really want to spend a little time on. How many of you have heard of soil organic matter? If I don't see every hand go up, please. Please, we've been talking about carbon for like six days, right? Carbon, soil organic matter. Soil organic matter is the quantity of the organic carbon in the system. It is the house. I want to present it to you in a slightly different way. Carbon exists in three phases. There are three phases of matter. And trust me, you've heard of them. Solid, liquid, gas, right? How many of you have heard of carbon markets? Anybody participating in them? Yeah? There is nothing wrong, well, I should say that. There's a lot of things wrong with carbon markets, but I'm not here to talk about what's wrong with carbon markets. I'm here to talk about the direction behind carbon market and how it relates. Carbon markets are concerned with the solid phase of carbon. If you look at your program, the original title to this talk was something, 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 and carbon sequestration. Okay? Don't like the term sequestration. Just throw it out. Because here's the problem with carbon sequestration. If we talk just about the solid phase of carbon, which is soil organic matter or organic carbon measured by dry combustion, it is essentially the same as saying, okay, I want you to take all, if everybody in this country took their paycheck next month and stuck it in a vault, what would happen to this economy? in one month, you'd crash. I mentioned it before, carbon is the currency of the soil, right? It is what's driving the soil economy. It builds infrastructure. It allows microbes to consume. It is the energy to do work. If we simply have the goal of taking carbon and locking all of it up in the solid phase, you shut down the soil system. The Haney test is going to measure this solid phase. It's going to measure it. It also measures a liquid phase. Water extractable organic carbon is the liquid phase. So using a different analogy, think of soil organic matter as your savings account. If you have one, fortunate enough to have one. Think of water extractable organic carbon as your checking account. The checking account is what you spend on a day-to-day -day basis to survive, to live, to carry out your functions. That is the fraction the organisms are using to drive the system. Now, every once in a while, things happen, and you have to dip or borrow money out of your savings account to cover something that happened that was unforeseen. Microbes do the same thing. They'll dip into that soil organic matter account if they have to. As producers, we have basically pushed organisms to live on the savings account. That is why when Jimmy talked about soil organic matter being at four to eight percent in this region and now it's at two or less, we've been withdrawing from the savings account for way too long. How do we get more money into the savings account? Quit farming, is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> Change farming practices, but in a, in a contextual sense, how do you get more money in your savings account? Earn more. 
Spend less. Reducing tillage slows down your spendage. Reducing synthetic inputs slows down your spendage. Increasing photosynthesis through cover crops, adding prairie food, stimulating microbes, building biology increases your income. So through management, you can do both simultaneously. Because what happens is, is that when you capture a larger income, yes, you're going to increase microbes and they're going to spend more. But remember, this is relative. If I told you that I spent $100,000 a day, you might go, wow, you must be broke. Yeah, either that or incredibly rich. Guys like Jeff Bezos could spend $100,000 a day and the accountant doesn't even know it, right? So it's relative. If you can capture that income, that carbon income, photosynthesis, and preserve the spending, let the microbes do what they do, because through the process of them converting gas phase, CO2 in the atmosphere, gets converted to liquid phase in the plant, the liquid phase is literally pumped into the soil, the microbes use that as the system, and then they develop solid phase. Soil organic matter is derived through microbial decomposition, okay? In my opinion, what prairie food has magically done and come up with is a way to take a large amount of solid phase carbon that was considered waste products that was not in the soil and speed the process up to turn that into liquid phase carbon that the microbes can now use to access the other carbon income. That's your crop residues, by the way, your manures, your compost, whatever else you have in your system. You're basically jump-starting this microbial community to use this energy to access this carbon to build soil organic matter, which is your solid phase. Does that make sense? Does it, is it, it, I mean, really, that's the problem with carbon markets is that when they talk about this, they talk about one part of it, solid phase. Just take it and lock it all away. Well, that doesn't work. Yes, it might get you a, a paycheck from the carbon company, and that, uh, that's fine. I'm not, a, I'm not against farmers getting paid for anything. My, well, I say anything, but a lot of things. But the problem we see, though, is that you are shutting down the economy of the soil. You have to have microbes doing work. Yes, they're going to generate CO2. Yes, it's going to go back to the atmosphere. That is okay. It's okay for me to spend $100,000 a day if I have it and if I do good with it, right? I really wanted to hammer that home. Now, part of this has to do with the seed imbalance, and I'm going to go like one more minute because I know we got to go on. So what do we have to do when it comes to carbon? Now, carbon is not it's alone. It's, it's tied to nitrogen. It's tied to phosphorus. It's tied to all these other things. So when we mention that organic in, all these proteins in the soil, right, we want the microbes to take those and eat the carbon and feed this back. So anybody in here that's got livestock understands ration balancing. When we look at the carbon to nitrogen ratio on this test, we're talking about ration balancing. So if you feed your soil system nothing but wheat, 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 you've thrown the balance off. Forget the problem with the lack of diversity. We're talking just carbon and nitrogen. You've thrown the balance off. Really high carbon, really low nitrogen. Microbes tie up nitrogen. How many of you have heard of people spraying 28% UAN on top of corn stalks? Right? Why are we doing that? Help break them down. Doing that is treating a symptom, by the way. You're just treating a symptom of a problem, treating a symptom of a disease. 
it has to do with really high carbon residue all the time. So microbes will tie this stuff up. So on the test, if we see a ratio above 20 to one, and this is in the water extract. This is the liquid phase. This is very different than the seed-in ratio of the residues, of the prairie food, of the compost, of whatever, and of the solid phase. The solid phase has a seed-in ratio of around 10 to 1, 12 to 1. Again, here, Brazil, Australia, it doesn't matter. So we're looking at this, and we are trying to figure out how fast these microbes are going to turn this out. It's a balance between energy and nutrition, carbon being the energy, the nitrogen being the protein and the nutrition. You can have too little or too much of either one and shut the system down. If you don't believe me, I'd, I'd advise you to go on a strict rice cake diet for a month, see how you feel. At the same time, just try to eat Flintstone vitamins for a month and see how you feel, okay? It's a balance, right? But that really is it. When you feed the system, you keep those things in mind, balancing that out. They do, absolutely. Pixie sticks for breakfast and Flintstone vitamins for dinner. I, when dad's watching them, that's how we work, yeah. Um, this is the information you get from that ratio. And again, don't read that. I make this available to you if you're interested. Final thing is the soil health calculation. So instead of just providing fertility recommendations, this test tries to pull together a lot of these different facets and, and, and pieces to track soil health. So the how is by understanding and establishing a baseline with some of these tools. Identify the goals. Is your seed in ratio out of whack? Is your respiration low? Do you have high salts? Do you have, you know, and then identify some of the reasons as to why those things may be. I have no fungi in my system. Let's evaluate that system. Heavy tillage system, very low carbon input. Fungi don't do well with either one of those. So if we want to address that, those are the first things we're going to target, right? And it might be as simple as a lack of fertility. I have seen that as well. I've seen systems with great soil health scores, really high numbers, can't produce. Potassium numbers are single digits on the extract, okay? So we don't throw that out. But we have to start looking beyond just those measurements, right? So here's how that score is calculated. All I'm going to say is this. We like to see the score start above 7. This is really scientific. I asked Rick Haney, I said, why 7? And he said, why not? That's not quite that simple. Uh, after looking at several tens of thousands of these, 7 at, at a 7 or above, we start to see a positive trend. Okay? So that's where we like to start. Balance the C to N ratio first from a management perspective. I don't care how fast your Corvette goes, according to the uh, speedometer, if you can't start the engine, it goes zero or as fast as you can push it. Balancing the ratio is what starts that system. So work on that first. You can do that a number of ways cover crops, manures, grazing management practices, prairie food amendments, changing your crop rotation. The, the, the choice is up to you. And what works best in your operation? These tools are here just to help you track and manage that. Uh, this is just an example of the report. I've got one sitting over here. Um, I'm showing this to you because a lot of people think you're getting one number, you're getting a soil health score, that's what you're getting. All in all, there's 50 some numbers on here. And this is kind of a slide, you can take a picture of this. This is kind of a how-to sample or when. And uh, generally with this, there's additional information and it's really hard to just come up with a blanket example of how to do this. All in all, sampling for PLFA, sampling for Haney test is very similar to conventional samples. You can do it by zone, you can do it by composites. Again, this is why establishing your goals is important. Do you want to do it based on yield maps? The only thing, and I've said this to a couple individuals in here, the only thing I generally recommend, don't do this on a two and a half acre grid program. This is not an $8 soil test. It's also not a $300 test, it's 50 bucks. 
but you don't want to run this on a two and a half acre grid program. Working with people like Heartland, they can pull soil samples, we work with them, we can actually make composite samples at the laboratory. Don't panic guys, I'm not asking you to do it. We can actually make composite samples at the laboratory based on zone maps, yield maps, et cetera, et cetera. We don't charge you for that. We can run, you can run grid program, you can overlay a Haney test for that field across that. So the reason I don't lay all that out up here is because it really is individually dependent on what it is you're trying to do. But we've seen it all, we've, watched, we've seen a lot of it, we work with a lot of it, and we can help you design that. So with that, there's my contact information. Uh, I wanna say thank you again to everybody. Um, I'm so glad I didn't talk after lunch, thanks Jess. Uh, but if you have any questions, I know Jess got some things to move on to. I will be here, you can come track me down because um, I know we kind of probably need to move on. So thank you. <laughs>